Like on your Facebook timeline? On your Instagram? Snapchat? You see them in real life? Like on TV? Not funny people. Like Jimmy Kimmel? Samantha Bee? On cable television. Like the real funny people. They don't make me laugh. They only see their point of view. They don't know they're not funny. How often do you see them? Every night. They're everywhere. You won't tell anyone my secret, right? No. Will you stay and tell me some jokes? I can't. We're about to tape. called The Death Becomes Her. Ooh. If anyone can remember that crappy film. I hated it. Send me a tweet. At. Ask Crowder. But, uh, speaking of which, by the way, producing with me in video studio, as always, is Jared, who is not gay. Follow him on Twitter. Not gay. Jared, meet us. Crowder with your comments, your thoughts, your photoshops. I fulfill my legal obligations. Drawing conclusions. Are we good? Uh, are we good? Hey, let me ask, this is the question of the day. What's your opinion on the idea of toxic masculinity? Hmm. I actually think it's potentially the most damaging concept being taught by leftists in schools today and i'll get into that later but what's your opinion have you really thought this this sort of colloquialism now toxic masculinity i'm interested to hear some all the rage but uh before we get into that we got some news that matters david hogg just announced a book deal oh gosh Uh, time.com says siblings david and lauren hogg are working on the name hashtag never again a new generation draws a line random house announced the book will come out june 5th that the hogs were donating their proceeds to charity and community organizations. Oh. So it's rumored actually to be 150 pages of them demanding that you take them seriously, followed by 150 pages of them claiming that you can't disagree with them because they're just kids and you can't bully them, with the forward written by Clock Boy. <laughs> you know, when I first saw it, never again, I thought it said, I thought it was hashtag because it's all together. Yeah. Never again. I'm like, oh, that, that stands to reason. <laughs> never again. <laughs> never <Yeah>. again. <laughs> yeah. I concede territory. I don't gate it. They were hit by school bus. Um, another story that really caught her eye a California woman just sued a lollipop company because she claimed she didn't realize there was sugar in lollipops. <laughs> she claimed Yum Earth knowingly engaged in deceptive marketing tactics by neglecting to list sugar, instead using the more opaque term evaporated cane juice, which I just assume, I don't know how you don't make that connection, yeah. but she is, she's going after them legally, and the lollipop company in question actually released their official legal response. Et cetera, et cetera. Lollipops contain sugar. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You ate the lollipops. The lollipops have sugar. You know they've always contained sugar. Therefore, you got diabetes, you fat bitch. So you get nothing. You lose. Good day, c- Now, see, Gerald is shocked because he heard the uncensored version right now that you didn't get to hear. I'm like, huh? Huh? What? Is this guy can't be associated with this program. The great thing is that they're, they're vitamin C lollipops. Yeah. That poor bitch thought she tricked the system. <laughs> she thought she won. Who can think of I can have vitamins. Healthy. It's not possible. Here's and thing. candy. You know how when you make a mistake, but then every now and then you're like, oh, th- hold on a second. I want to blame someone else, but this is also embarrassing for me. Yeah. Shouldn't I didn't know candy had sugar be on that list? It should. Yeah. It should stop you cold uh, in you your tracks. You should go, ooh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out looking worse. Yeah, don't yeah. hit send. My hands will get dirty. Not to mention, Lollipops 2018. You can't give those things away at the bank. Like, you true. can't nah. give them away. People would rather nah. steal pens. They give me the smarties. <laughs> <laughs> Toby the cat. This is a story that people won't be happy to hear, but it has a happy ending. Toby it. the cat oh. walked 12 miles to get home to its family. <laughs> And they immediately asked the shelter to euthanize it. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Comes from Fox 5 San Diego. Oh, so he could have walked 500 miles, and he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. This is the best uh, cat story 
Yes. No, hold on a second. Well, let, let me, so Toby's family decided they no longer wanted him, the article goes on to say. So they gave him to another family, but Toby missed them, walked 12 miles back. When he got there, the family wanted him euthanized. Luckily, the shelter contacted Aww. the SPCA of Wake County, call it bad ending. who took him Whatever. in and uh, helped him find a new family. Now, it would seem like a happy ending if you missed the subtext. The context matters that this was the infamous rapist cat. See? Yeah, see? There's a twist that you didn't. Context you. matters. <laughs> it was actually, it, and actually, we only found out, he had a good discussion. We actually only found out after the new yeah. adoptive children were reportedly uh, tweeting out the Meow 2 movement. <laughs> <laughs> Do you realize I just accidentally said Meow? Movement. Mew, I would say movement. movement. Hashtag movement. Meow 2, but I was in Meow puns all day. Yes. Meow puns all day. All day. <laughs> Give that cat nine life sentences. It's like Mr. Freeze with There's a storm coming. There's a storm Everybody coming. chill. I think Arnold just lived, must have been like Heath Ledger's yeah. The Joker, just living in his own personal hell with that method acting, Mr. Freeze. <laughs> Uh, so it was. It was. They were tweeting out the hashtag now too, and it was. It was all but confirmed by this uh, recorded leaked nine one one call. Hello nine one one. What's your emergency? Yeah, to Toby won't, won't, won't stop. He's he's here, and he I, I blocked in the bedroom. Okay, sir, calm hey, down. You won't stop talking about the the, the casting couch. And he, he, he promised me lead roles in great films. Okay, sir. He said Slow I had, he said down. I had eight quality, but I, I he only ended up getting me a, a walk on okay, role sir, in the Big calm Bang down. Theory. Uh, I, and I, Toby the Cat got you a walk-on role on the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, I know, yeah, and he promised so much more. Okay, sir, I sir, just, uh, I, uh, okay, sir, I need you to listen to me very carefully. Uh, Is Kaylee Cuoco as cool in real life as she seems on the show? Because I imagine she'd be really cool. Yeah, she's, she's pretty cool. Oh, God, Toby's coming to the window! The blood is on your hands, SPCA. <laughs> You allowed this pervert into a house. Oh, good lord! Can't keep his paws off him. Oh, come on! Ooh, ooh! The I right can go all day with these. <laughs> I sincerely hope not. But the main takeaway is just kill all cats. Kill yes, all cats. thank uh, you. Hashtag you know, cat control now. <laughs> Spawn of Satan. Hashtag meow too. I'm sorry that that's how we started this show. <laughs> <laughs> what did you expect? And I'm sorry for this next uh, story. Amy Schumer's uh, slightly anticipated new movie here. <laughs> oh. And the ratings are coming in. Unfortunately for her, she's only received 35 tomatoes on the dollar. So that's <laughs> been tough for her. <laughs> and they've reformatted the rating system. What happened? It's now a 94. It's 95, 94. Uh, nice. Amy Schumer is the ugly friend of cinema. She just, they just keep her around so Jennifer Lopez can feel good about her movies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like now, see? The cell doesn't look looks so bad, right? No, it's still bad. Terrible. No, I think Melissa McCarthy any day. She knows who she is. It, Melissa McCarthy is funny. And that's yeah. the thing yeah. that you can tell with Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer, look, look at Trainwreck, right? Yeah. She was believable enough where they played the hot single girl who doesn't want to settle down. And now she plays the fat chick. So you know at some point she made the conscious decision, okay, I was the cute young it comic. Now I'm going to try and compete. I'm going to try and go tit for tat with Melissa yeah. McCarthy. And the truth is Melissa McCarthy is a funnier actress. Yeah, and sure. Her stick, her stick is just... I'm fat and ugly and disgusting, but also kind of hot, right? Like right, in a 2018 right. sort of way? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm also kind of hot, me. right? I'm not hot because anymore. It's, because it's time? <laughs> it's time? It's time? It's time for this week's time. It's time for this week's Eye on India. Why do we pick an India? Because it sucks. So an Indian <laughs> minister was ridiculed for saying that ancient India invented the internet. Oh, Comes from the oh. BBC. Biplab Deb, who is the chief minister of the northeastern state of Tripura, not only claimed that the internet, but satellite technology was created in ancient <laughs> India. He cited an example from the ancient Hindu epic Mahabharat that one of the characters in the epic Sanjaya, that's never a good sign, had been given had been able to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of a battle that was taking... Anyway, the point is that he was basically claiming that India invented both the internet and the satellite <laughs> technology, which was met with skepticism, if you can imagine, with historians and scientists using corroborating historical documents, as well as selenium dating, ultimately to come to the conclusion that it's unlikely the invention of the internet predates today's Indian practice of still pooping in the streets. They said that's highly... <laughs> un oh. It's a tough sell. <laughs> It'd be like they're man on the moon. Be like, we can put a man, we can invent the internet and satellite, but we're still pooping in the streets. <laughs> we invented the internet. 
thought Al Gore invented the internet. Was he Indian? Well, I know. When, 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 Al, when Al Gore theory is more believable, you know you've jumped a shark yeah. society. <laughs> he loved his Mulligatani. Of course, it should be noted that Mr. Deb is a member of the Hindu nationalist BJP government. See, oh, this uh, is what happens yeah. when you combine nationalism with a nation that sucks. <laughs> yes. Another news in India watch, because we can keep these going all day. From New Delhi, a dying 700-year-old banyan tree has been put on a drip. Yes, it's just <laughs> what you see for those listening on the audio. According to a news agency, uh, one of the branches was infected by termites, so determined to save the tree, they put up drips. <laughs> what? To kill off the insects. So in their defense, the tree did have cholera, which explains why it, too, had been pooping in the streets. That's what they, that's what they're, it's their calling card. <laughs> See, my, 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 my thing is, it's a 700-year-old tree that's been stuck in India for this entire time. <laughs> it's true. Give it a medal and let it die. Let it go. It's let it go. Time. Like it's, <laughs> you know, set it free. I would wonder what those holes at the bottom of the trees were for. Now I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, how they, check, that, that's yeah. how they check the age in yeah. uh, India. They just, they just check how many blown O-rings there are. Oh. <laughs> oh. For people who understand the genre Terrible. of tree dating... Methods, that's funny. Uh, all right, yeah, that's it. That, has been, that has been our eye on India. We don't need the outro. We don't need the outro. I don't even want to do it because now we move to it. We're international. That's Before right. we get into toxic masculinity, then Dennis Prager, if he ever comes back on the show. A German <laughs> theater. No. Did you read this? You, you read this story. Read a German this, theater yeah. is now offering free seats to spectators willing to wear swastikas. Let me explain. <laughs> <laughs> the theater in Constance is offering free admission to spectators willing to wear an armband with a Nazi swastika. Spectators who choose to pay will be asked to wear a Star of David as a sign of solidarity with the victims of the nationalist socialist <laughs> Nazis. <laughs> Which honestly put German Jews at this theater in an awkward position. Because obviously the swastika, on the other hand, free. <laughs> um, <laughs> by the way, first to take advantage of this promotion, already camped outside this theater like a Star Wars premiere. No surprise. I think we have a, we have a picture still. There you go. Oh. oh. <laughs> well, I expected Count expected. Dankula, Pug, but... Sven computer. Look, um, all in the name of hot pee pee. <laughs> <laughs> I know he said all in the name of art. Beep, beep, but I said like all in the name of a hot beep. <laughs> <laughs> My heart still beats. For this was the guy. All right. Did you try to expense that trip too? Yeah, I did. Exactly. That's not going to be clear in the company card. I'm surprised it went so basic. Everyone knows poop swastikas are all the rage. Poop yeah. swastikas are all yeah, the come rage. On. Yeah. Do something unique. Uh, hey, by the way, uh, according to the Huffington Post, Robert De Niro gave Donald Trump another savage nickname. That's the actual <laughs> Burn. Like, headline. Okay, I'll bite. So De Niro <laughs> said America was being run by a madman who wouldn't recognize the truth if it came inside a bucket of his beloved Colonel Sanders fried chicken. He dubbed Trump our low life in chief, quote. <laughs> I guess it doesn't take much to make this guy laugh anymore. Dude, why didn't he just hire writers? You know what I mean? When oh. people are this this rich, yeah. we, we, we can't get anyone to write for a show because they're absolutely petrified at the yes. notion of being associated with this show. Yeah. Uh, I th but the biggest thing is, I, I think Robert De Niro, he, he thinks he outsmarted Trump on this one. He doesn't realize he's just completely playing into the hand. He's playing along. Lying Robert De Niro. Yeah, yeah well, uh, you are a lowlife in chief. <laughs> yes, you are. You're the, you are the lowlife in chief, my friend. I bounced that one off my mom. I know it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people should just not have a platform to speak about these things. Yeah. It makes them look stupid. Well, he has a platform, but, you know, we can also have a, he just acknowledged that he's retarded. So um, I don't think there's much else to say about that. But, you know, Robert De Niro, uh, it's sad to see how the mighty have fallen. It's true. Started with Rocky and Bullwinkle. Now, the famous Nashville window washer, we talked about this, uh, for those who aren't Mug Club members in the Daily Show a while back, the famous Nashville window washer who, who brought joy to many by dressing yeah. up as Spider-Man and he would wash windows at a children's hospital. Well, it turns out he's a child pornographer. Oh. <laughs> so he was sentenced to 105 years. Uh, what? Yeah, dressing up as Spider-Man. Though, really, looking back, considering what he handed in with his resume, we, we, we should have seen this coming. <laughs> Look out! Here comes the pedophile. Look out! Here comes the pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> you don't exactly have Neil Diamond on the payroll, okay? <laughs> That's some really niche stuff. The costumes Good. with hospital kids. 
Hey, kid. I got progeria? Say- <laughs> <Gosh. laughs> oh, dear Lord. By the way, I forgot for internet. how bad our show was. I was so sick oh, on Tuesday. God. Jared sucked. I sucked. Oh, and it was just, awful. So every, I left every the state seconds, not to be on it. <laughs> I was hitting the cough button and I still am. I don't know what this is. I picked up SARS at the Toronto airport or something. Okay. Cough button. Hold on. Cover for me. That was, that was the best of us. There we go. Let it out. Big yeah, I sound like out. Robert De Niro laughing in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Counselor. Uh, take, an, take an antibiotic, dude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stop it. You don't want to take this. You don't have a colon. You don't want to take the antibiotics. Next, People that's just true. go to that. Go, sure. They go to it right away. You don't take it unless you need it. And if you do it, you take it with, with some yeah, probiotics. Yeah, what an antibiotic now? Turn your pee I around. will say this about the, the Spider-Man window washing pedophile. Um, I don't. The guy didn't earn it. But the guy put in his work, so it's never earned. What? It's not. But the guy, the guy put in work. Come on, most people just get a paneled van. You're dressing up as Spider Man at a children's hospital. I mean, outside the windows. Listen, Jeez. the guy is yeah. obviously a pervert, just like Toby the, the cat went back to. But good, good. Yeah. 105. Not years. good for not good for him, but. It, you don't see a work ethic like that. That's, 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 hashtag that's, hashtag hey, respect. Hashtag, that, hashtag blessed. You walked a tightrope there, my friend. <laughs> no, watch. They're gonna try. They're gonna try and Milo me. You supported pedophilia. Right, exactly. Not at all. I'm just saying there probably are easier ways yeah. for somebody to be a sure. pedophile. We're not salon. Come he on, didn't take the path that. of least resistance. <laughs> All right, so listen, I want to talk about this. We've been talking about this for, for a while, but we, we realized we haven't really done a segment specifically on this. We were planning no. on doing it in Illinois. Yep. Because on college campus, they, they, they teach. So. so I want to talk about the pervasive myth taught yeah. at schools across the country known as toxic masculinity. Big word. This is the term. And, 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 and why, ironically, the term and the philosophy itself, I think is toxic to both men and women alike. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the most damaging things taught in school. So pro- progressives, they use the term toxic masculinity. You guys have heard this. Yep. Yeah. To describe what they believe are sort of culturally constructed norms for male behavior that are innately evil. So dominance, aggression, competitiveness, strength, et cetera, all these things. Um, and, and the reason that this has been at the forefront, because after school shootings, for example, leftists, they, they always come out in droves and toxic masculinity is a part of the dialogue. Women are better, unfortunately. We are oh. not the murderers of oh. our society. Toxic masculinity is better really blood. crushing men in this country. The right is chiefly responsible for keeping toxic masculinity in our national discourse. They epitomize that toxic masculinity and they well, fuel the it. Men are committing most of the crimes and most of the murders. There is a huh. problem with men. Right. Well, women are doing so well, and that's what's causing the toxic masculinity. They're not happy about it, and that's why the murders have gone up since 2000. 11. So That's actually, true. men are not as good as women. We are actually better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> better. I, we are better. I, 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 like forming sentences or finishing them? Yeah. <laughs> better at what specifically? Please give me a list of things that you think you're better at. Giving birth. Don't bring your biology into this. <laughs> so they suggest the solution is to change our culture so that boys are more feminine. This is what you see everywhere right now. Now, it is it is true, by the way. We have to give uh, concede some territory here. Men do commit most of the violent crimes. Yeah, that's on us. But this dis- Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Guilty. You take that one. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. Got into my first fist fight as a grown adult man three weeks ago. Guilty. Guilty. Yeah. Um, we can't talk about it for no, legal purposes. No, no legal purposes. But <laughs> yes. the discrepancy... And aggression is, is, is it's not it's not created all by culture, which undercuts the argument to begin with. So as a society, by the way, we condemn criminal activity. We yes, punish yep. it severely with prison and even the death penalty. Some cultures discourage violent activity more than others. But across the board, men do commit more violence. OK, now here's the thing. The difference is largely biological. And we'll come back to that, along with a symphony of hormones that men have in droves compared to their female counterparts. Like the male hormone, of course, testosterone. There are, there's more. There's different variables like luteinizing hormone, growth hormone, which we have in higher, much higher ratios than women. But let's let's start with testosterone. It's linked to higher rates of violence, aggression, risk-taking, and competitiveness. So first off, let's start with this. They're using a biological argument to condemn men. All right? Marley was dead to begin with. So how do we know it's biology? Specifically, the hormones that are causing this and not the culture? Well, because we know that testosterone actually has the same effect on women. Women commit more violent crimes who have higher testosterone levels. And of course, listen, if you don't believe that chart, there's always the eyeball test. The last one was a cheat. <laughs> Shouldn't have let trannies compete in professional sports. <laughs> Lesson uh, learned. By the way, oh, yeah, I know we cheated. You were guilty. Learning. And uh, men cheat more. And by the way, testosterone is also linked to aggressive behavior in increasing animals. So let's be clear. Testosterone is linked to that. But testosterone isn't just evil. 
right? This is, this is a, a fundamental premise for toxic masculinity. It doesn't automatically result in violent criminals. Uh, it's actually associated with a, a, a wide range of symptoms, if you want to call them, or traits. But they can be positive or negative depending on how they're harnessed. So risk-taking, aggression, these are good in some circumstances. Yeah. Look at Winston Churchill. Society needs some strong, brave men pr to protect the weak. For example, that woman who went in to say women are better, she went into a, a, a building likely guarded by armed men. <laughs> Competitiveness can drive economic growth. We see why capitalists hating progressives dislike these traits so much. By the way, a recent study found that groups with higher testosterone levels were the most successful at completing collective tasks, so even working with other people. This idea that it only helps the individual if they're just aggressive. No, actually, testosterone helps teamwork. Now, here's something else that I find interesting. Uh, not only does testosterone, of course, trigger aggressive competitive behavior in the face of a threat, but in the absence of a threat, it's directly associated with pro-social traits like protectiveness and generosity. Huh. You can find this at PubMed. That's surprising. Yeah. High testosterone generosity. I find that very surprising, actually. I wonder if it's just, I don't, I don't know if they include buying drinks at the bar as generosity. <laughs> I don't know. It surprised me, I too. am the most generous person you know, then. Yes, this is true. <laughs> at that point, really, you're just being fleeced. Mm. People know they say, uh -huh. he's at the bar, he'll buy you five apple teenies. <laughs> Testosterone's off the charts. It's him. true. So, <laughs> granted, by the way, I, I, again, we have to concede some ground here. Of course, sometimes men have gotten it wrong. When you look back, for example, on some Hollywood classics, I mean, like, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this one. Tell you about them sobbing women who lived in the Roman days. It seems that they all went swimming while their men was off to graze. Well, a Roman troop was riding by and saw them in their me oh my. So they took them all wow. back home to dry. Oh, At least that's what okay. Plutarch says. I'm here today to get me a wife. <laughs> I need to go back home empty-handed. <laughs> Well, you're all pretty and fresh and young. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind. I'll keep you in mind. Oh, yes, them women were sobbing, 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 fucking tears. Mighty sad. <laughs> Get up, Oh, they acted angry and annoyed. But secretly, they was overjoyed. You might recall <laughs> that when Corral and your steer. Oh, 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 oh that poor little dear. Why don't we go down and get him? Okay, that one, that, that's one for you, yeah. feminists. By Correct. the way, we actually have some archived, never-before-seen footage from yeah, the director. Very, uh, very hashtag blessed. Yeah, at that. the end of the segment, before <laughs> yeah. Dennis Prager, um, it gets worse, just so, you know, in case you're wondering. So here, here's the problem, though, with the progressive left as it relates to toxic masculinity. The very existence of the growing LGBTQ AAIP acronym, the very protests against racial profiling or the non-existent wage gap, all of this is predicated on the idea that generalizations are bad. Yet we see the most corrosive generalizations coming from today's progressive left as with Black Lives Matter. They see all black people as a monolith. We've talked about this. We've had black guests on uh -huh. who have yeah. said the white privilege you have is not actually being expected to think one way. All black people should share the same social, economic, political, and ethical opinions because melanin. Uh, the same for the Women's March and the Pussy Hat Economics, right? Yeah. All women support socialism. They support killing babies because vagina. Now they want to put the biological genie back in the bottle with toxic masculinity through false social engineering. It's not culture. It is biology. You're blaming men for their biology. Can you see the problems that might result from this? And by the way, being okay with biological generalizations uh, in the aforementioned hate groups is hate speech hmm. when yeah. it's not toxic. For example, I don't think all black people should think the same. Okay, I would never presume that they do. But biologically, there's a reason every single sprinting record is held by a black person. Racist! How dare you? <laughs> Look at the top 10. <laughs> Look at the top 20. You might be lucky to find a Greek guy in there somewhere because he <laughs> ate his Wheaties. <laughs> For example, I would never assume that all women are economically left nor right, nor that all women are pro-abortion nor pro-life. But biologically, only women can get pregnant. Transphobic! What if we talked about to toxic femininity? Ooh. Here's the truth. Men act the way they do and the way that they always have acted because of their biology. That's an accurate biological generalization. What the left does is try to cloak their disdain for men by saying that it's social. It's a societal construct. Because if they don't, they're acting as the worst bigots out of all of us. If masculinity really is biological, or at least even a portion of it, as we've proven today, think about how terrible the term toxic masculinity is. Think, what, what if we had hashtag black lives toxic? You'd be run out on a rail, and, and rightfully so. Now, I, by the way, I don't bring this up to fist bump uh, the men's rights movement or to try and push no. some false idea of machismo, but again, to point out that the fake victim and outrage culture creates real victims. You know, we, men screw up all the time. We understand that. But you take something, a small group of a, a, a subset of a group, and you start to label the entire group. You know mm -hmm. what that does? Everybody who, like me and you, are not 
these toxic masculinity kind of people. We get pissed off because you're picking on us every single time. You're lumping us in with everybody else. Well, even worse. I mean, we're, we're grown adults, arguably. Um, <laughs> That's debatable. You, you sleep in a race car bed. But imagine. Aww. imagine That, that was the, the, the circle of trust. <laughs> No, your race no, car I'm bed out, is I'm not out. a circle of trust. I told you, don't invite me for the wine nights on your race car bed. <laughs> Gerald Weinstein. But imagine imagine not just us. We get pissed off with it. But being a 12-year-old 12, 12 boy today, and your entire life you've been burdened with the guilt of toxic masculinity. You've been told that everything you're hardwired to do is bad. It's just toxic. It's violent. But the good news is you just need to change. You just need to become more like a woman. Yeah. Do you think there's uh, one of the reasons they have such a problem with it is because there are so many parallels between masculinity and conservatism and femininity and liberalism? You mean the rugged individualism, yeah, the collective, yeah, yeah. and the feelings versus facts? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. That's a good point. Well, can't we can't we just encourage all the wonderful, beautiful Christian women out there to be great Christian women? And can we just have the guys that are doing it the right way and holding open doors and sacrificing their lives to save women and children on boats that are going down? Can't we just encourage that? And, and just... the video's been demonetized. <laughs> By the way, I don't know what to do with revolving doors. Tweet me and let me know. Yeah, that's tough. How do you hold that open? <laughs> uh, because here's the truth. Think about it. There are millions, tens of millions of boys who've grown up hearing just that. Now, do you think, let me ask you this, do you think that that boy is more likely to grow up as a strong man, a moral leader, head of household, or less likely? Do you think he's more likely to love women and to treat them respectfully, compassionately, or to develop animosity toward them for accusing him of being a toxic cretin? Do you think he's more likely to become a compassionate husband and a loving father? Or do you think he'll run away from marriage with his hair on fire? I bring this up because if we're, gonna, if we're going to scream, please think of the children. And if your professors and their complicit media brethren are going to spout this nonsense, they need to know the serious generational consequences that this lie can create. So there's one factor, we've talked about this, that determines the statistical likelihood of a yeah. child making it in this world, from mm -hmm. finishing school, to going to college, to avoiding prison, to domestic abuse, to drug use, to teen pregnancy, to school violence, and that stat is singularly. Does a child have a daddy? And is daddy still in the picture? So what do you think is going to create more? And by the way, all of us here are man enough to admit when we're wrong. Back to the seven brides for mm -hmm. seven brothers director's cut, I'll, I'll admit, in retrospect, a little tone deaf. Take a look. Dennis Prager after this. Ah, uh, gee, I don't think I'm ever going to find a man. I, I mean, woman. Oh, well, why don't you just do like the Romans did with those Sabin women, or Sabine women, whatever they're called. Now, see, those Romans, they were in the same kind of fixed urine. They were out there exploring new territories, and resources were scarce. But see, they had these Sabin women south of town. And what those Romans do? They went on down there, snatched them up, and carried them off. And if you can't do better than a bunch of old Romans, well, you're no brothers of mine. The Romans? Weren't those the ones I read about who set up north of here? No, I'm talking about the olden times. I read about it in Sven Computer's book. Ah, uh, a book. I'm talking about history. This really happened. Tell you about them sobbing women who lived in the Roman days. It seems that they all went swimming while their men were off to graze. Well, the Roman troop was riding by and saw them in their meal. My soul, they took them all back home to dry. At least that's what Plutarch said. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This song sounds a little bit rapey. Rapey? No, you just haven't heard the rest of the song. And the women were sobbing, 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 fit to be tied. Every muscle was throbbing, throbbing from that riotous ride. Seems they cried and kissed and kissed and cried all over that Roman countryside. So don't forget that when you're taking a bride, sobbing fit to be tied from that riotous ride. Yep, yeah, nope, definitely rapey. No. No, no I, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with this. I mean, these, these, these women, clearly not even willing participants. Yeah, you should have seen the original version. Original version? Oh, them bitches were sobbing, 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 screaming out loud. And the peckers were throbbing, 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 ready to plow. Oh, they rant and scream and scream and rant while I service myself in their potted plants. She won't forget that. When she talks to the fuzz, she'd better keep quiet because she'd only be making it worse. Holy sh! Glad to have our next guest. Uh, usually, 
Here's the thing. First guest of the night. Usually yeah. we have him on for a long form interview because we can't get it done in you know the 15 minutes that we would typically do on a Thursday sure. show. However, I just got his book, and full disclosure, I just received it this morning, so I was not able to read it, but I'm looking forward to it. It's nice. the Rational What's Bible. The Bill O'Reilly thing. You say you read twice. Yeah, I've read it twice. Just looking out for the folks. No, uh, the Rational Bible. You can purchase it on Amazon. Of course, he is the radio host, author of this book, and creator of Prager University. Dennis Prager, how are you, sir? When I'm with you, well, actually, I'm, I'm pretty good all the time, but I'm even better with you. And that's not a joke. I really am a big fan. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we always love having you on the show. And as promised, we'll have you on for a, fu a full hour show uh, once I've been able to dive into this book. But I want to start with the idea, the, the concept. By the way, this book is really exciting. Did you see this? It's very nice. It's like crocodiles. I know. Everyone's going he soft no covering ebooks. He spares no expense. Um, it really isn't a normal The, the New York Times bestseller list. What, what is what is the deal behind it? I've never really been able to understand it. I know that there have been issues with Jordan Peterson. You know, I see people who are top on Amazon, like yourself right now, with this book, it, and it never cracks the New York Times. Well, explain to this to a simpleton like me, Mr. Pigger. There is no explanation. That's why I my column on Tuesday, uh, National Review, Town Hall, and other places, which the New York Times responded to yesterday, with a whole series of tweets, which is very uncommon. Yeah, uh, they. Uh, I. I believe that I. I opened up a scab. Yeah, uh, because this is the great, unspoken, universally, virtually universally known thing. The New York Times bestseller list is not a bestseller list. What is it? We man? don't know what we we don't know. We really don't know. <laughs> it, I, and I, I'm not joking. You're we, we you're really the old, you're the know. almighty one here. You're smart. I'm giving you the you don't know either. Let Who me do tell I you. Ask? I I think it is easier to find out the ingredients of Coca Cola yeah. than it is to know how the New York Times derives its bestseller list. It's not based on bestseller. I show and I I I, I don't care really. Uh, the, the book will do great whether or not it's on the Times bestseller list. But it's number two on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, number two on uh, Publishers Weekly, which is the Bible of the publishing industry, bet their bestseller list. Number one, uh, according to Ingram, which sells the books to 85% of the stores. Right. So the, the people who distribute it say it's number one. And it's not even 15 on the New York Times bestseller list. So there has been a long time suspicion that uh, that politics, if you're a conservative and especially a religious book, the chances that doesn't mean there were no conservative books on. Right. My last book was on, but it was on for one week and that was it. Uh, but. Uh, th there's a general realization it's it's not for real. It's sort of like the hard copy YouTube algorithm. No one really knows what it means. No one knows how to work it. No one knows how to play by the rules, and they could be changing without us knowing. I've never been, I know Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson, has been on the... Uh, okay, so here's the thing. Okay, so I mentioned Peterson. Yes. I said Peterson is the number one best-selling book. On, I'm number two. Right. He's the number one, and he's not even on their list. So they responded... Because we only put on books that are uh, printed or published by American uh, publishing houses. What? But first of all, which is bizarre. So it's not a bestseller list. Right. Uh, let's be honest. Number two, it's published by Random House Canada. But Random House is an American company. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm surprised they would even publish it in Canada, though, with the hate speech laws and all the facets and all the variables. I, um, sure. uh, I'm sure David Hogg's new book will be. Yeah, of course. Of David Hogg just got also a book Random deal. House. You can you can absolutely guarantee that'll be a number one New York Times best. What David Hogg got a book a book. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, Random House. Yeah, with Random House. <laughs> How much did they pay him? Too much, Dennis. Too much. That's really what it comes down to. Martin more than Don Lemon. Well, let me ask you this. As someone who's, a, that's actually, it's completely an offshoot here, but as someone who's obviously a, a deeply moral man and you talk about right and wrong, and, and actually I'll talk about at the end of this show, that the happiness hour, I've been thinking about that quite a bit lately. Uh, it's, an, it's an hour that he does specifically in the show just devoted to happiness and your moral obligation to be happy. So as a moral person, as someone who deals with philosophy more, what's your view on a David Hog, is it bullying to absolutely dissect and destroy his ideas because he's underage? Obviously, he plays both cards. Treat me like an adult. Treat me seriously. And then says, I'm a child. Don't bully me. What do you believe is the, the morally correct approach with a little... Morally theme? correct approach is, is to respond 
to how he behaves and how he speaks. Uh, I don't mock people in any, whatever their age, so I, I don't use that sort of thing. Uh, but you are entirely right. They said the left sends kids out. Then when you attack what they say, you're a bully for attacking a kid. I had this, the, the Democrats had at their convention when Dick Cheney was still vice president. So we're talking about 12 years ago right. uh, or whatever it is, yeah, 10 years ago. And they had a girl get up. I think she was like 14. And all she did was mock, mock the vice president, which I would never have. I would never allow my child to mock a Democrat. My father uh, allowed I, it, and look how it turned out. So you probably made a good decision. <laughs> well, that no, that is a good challenge to what I just said. <laughs> I mock everyone I, regardless of I, age. I go the I, other way. I like the way you turned out. <laughs> now, anyway, so she's just crapping on the vice president of the United States, and I found that offensive. I don't want 14-year-olds uh, crapping on the president or vice president, whatever party. Right. It's that. That's not their business. And I was, oh, you deluged with, oh, look, Prager, yeah, conservatives, they pick on 14-year-old girls. That's it. That's what they do. Right. Yeah. Well, I remember I got in trouble because uh, Jonathan Crone was this conservative young guy at CPAC, and uh, I was on a Fox News show, and I made a joke. I said something to the effect of, I have skivvies older than this kid. I just don't know that he should be a keynote speaker. And I got some flack on some blogs, and conservatives gave me crap, and uh then I had to introduce him. I had to introduce him, followed by Bill Bennett and Senator Rick Santorum. And he's in the green room. And once he found out I was a Fox News contributor, he's like, oh, so are you on, on like panels? And I'm sitting there going, please just don't run a search of what I've said. And it was just a harmless <laughs> joke. And then I got in trouble because I said, you know what? I'm uncomfortable with using children as, uh, as political pawns because someone like this, this was Jonathan Crone at the time, 14-year-old conservative activist, was really popular. I said, I think that there's a strong chance he'll become a pot-smoking hippie uh, at Berkeley. And you know what? I was right about everything except he went to Columbia and he ended up writing for Salon. <laughs> you can't <So>. write that. <laughs> the conservatives are just guilty yep. of it. Yeah. The kids, probably good kids. I felt like I felt like Clint Eastwood in Gran Torino just going down like a crucifix riddled with bullets for that kid because I was like, this kid absolutely has it coming. Speaking of bullies, what's going on with your YouTube case, uh, uh, Mr. Prager? The, uh, Prager, you filed suit with YouTube and I've just heard some bad news, but I want you to explain it. Well, right now we're good, we're appealing because the judge. Remember, this is the Ninth Circuit. I don't know what you know about the Ninth Circuit. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's to uh, uh, it's a little to the right of Lenin, and I don't mean John Lenin. I mean Vladimir Lenin. Yes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they ruled. This was the interesting thing. So she ruled against us. But without prejudice, meaning we can appeal if we present a different argument. Okay. Right. But what is interesting, and to me, this is a partial victory. She said, and I had said this before she ever rendered her verdict. I said, it will be a victory for Prager University and for the country, more important for the country, if the judge merely announces the truth is Google YouTube is not neutral, is in fact politically motivated, right. ideologically driven. Sure enough, she said, the notion that YouTube uh, is, uh, is neutral uh, and a conduit for all views, these are her words, is mere puffery. Wow. Is this legal terminology that I'm not necessarily... Yes. Puffery. No, no, but it, but it means what it is in yeah. real language. It's right. not just, it is legal terminology. It means it's just, it's, it's hyperbole of an advertiser. Right, absolutely. Okay, so fine. So that, I agree. Yeah. But that's a big deal. That is now officially noted. It isn't true. They are politically driven. Well, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I'm sure you guys have some tricks up your sleeve because I know some PragerU people were there at the YouTube meeting, and uh, mm -hmm. they went to great lengths to ensure us that that was not the case, that YouTube was a neutral platform. So that's the issue. The issue isn't they can ban whoever they want. The issue is if you're being dishonest about selectively right. banning people. That's correct. That's exactly right. Well, we're doing the same thing you know, with Twitter right now. Uh, we talked about this at the SMU show. Our half Asian lawyer, Bill Richmond, has filed a, a petition for information from Twitter because of the ban and the South by Southwest. You know, these policies we don't understand. We don't know why there was the ban. And uh, we don't know if they have an office still in Texas. So that'll determine how we move forward. Because in California, I don't think they're required to actually release those documents. So to me, you know what? It's a victory. If Twitter says, 
all you want is information regarding your account and people calling you a neo-Nazi and photoshopping swastikas on you, we're not going to reveal those documents or information. If they refuse to, that's already a victory to me. Because we just, it's not about monetary uh, damages. It's about information here. It's about getting answers. Oh, we don't want monetary. It's, it's of no interest to us to get, to get money from them. We, we simply want them to uphold what they stand for. So what's the next step for you with, with YouTube? It's, you it's uh, our, uh, our legal team is Pete Wilson's legal team. They came up with the idea. Pete Wilson's former governor and senator of California. He's a, he's a, a big supporter of PragerU. He's a big fan of my show. And uh, kindly, he came out and said, you guys got to sue. This is disgusting. So they have been handling all of this, and they are going to they're going to present other arguments and resubmit it to the uh, to the court. Well, good luck with that. You know, it's funny we talked about a turning point for us when I was trying to work within the rules and, and get videos monetized on YouTube and find out why we were in restricted mode. A turning point for us was when they demonetized and manually reviewed it and said this is not advertiser friendly. It was our long form interview on human nature, if human beings are naturally good or evil. That was the video. No profanity. It wasn't even political. And they said, this is not suitable for advertisers. I said, there's got to be a blacklist. And Prager's on it. <laughs> that, that is fascinating that that was the subject. Yeah. That, that is one of the great dividing lines between the right and the left. I wonder if it's that's because... That's why, by the way, that's why I love the Bible. <clears throat> people who believe in that Bible, people who believe in that, understand that people are not basically good. Right. The, the, the left and the secular world have a romantic view of human nature that has caused much more damage. Because when you know we're flawed, you know you have to work on your character every day. You have to work on your children's character every day. Right. But if we're basically good, all you need is love. Right, exactly. And you make yourself, you know, the, people think idolatry is only, a, you know, a golden calf as we're talking about with Exodus. But idolatry today is... is you know, David Hogg, it's making yourself the god of your own universe, seeing yourself as perfect. That's if you, right. It's the difference between saying, I'm the greatest hockey player who's ever lived, I don't need to fix it, or waking up every day saying, you know what, there are things to improve. Yep. That's the, the belief, if you believe that human beings are naturally, uh, I don't want to say evil, but not necessarily intrinsically good. Let me ask you this, because I know it's yep. Exodus, God, slavery, and freedom. We'll talk about this when you come back, but just to tease right. it, I would imagine you probably have some answers in here for people who say, well, you're talking about a God who encouraged slavery, if you read about God who killed tons of people. Uh, right. I'd imagine you address this. That's why it's called the Rational Bible. The best statement about this work, and this is my life's work, uh, that's volume one of my life's work. The best description was it gives intelligent people permission to believe. That's a fantastic way to put it. And uh, I, well, uh, Gerald had to go, but he's actually an apologist. He does uh, he does some teaching at, at churches uh, across this state. And yeah, it really is. It's one of those issues that I think for a long time atheists had the corner on intellectualism, and that's slowly breaking down as they've created this unholy alliance with the progressive left, where people are saying, you know what? For the first time, I'm willing to listen to someone like Dennis Prager. For the first time, I'm willing to listen to someone like Jordan Peterson because these atheists I respect that have gone so far around the bend, maybe there is a rational way to approach the Bible. And uh, where's the best place for people to find it, uh, Senor? Well, Amazon is the easiest, obviously, but their local bookstore, even Costco uh, in most places has it. Costco. So I tell you, I, I am very proud to say, who else has had a Bible commentary at Costco? Uh, Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Yeah, the New, New Testament. A long time ago. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And they, and, they, and they did not have sixty-two inch screens then. Right, and it wasn't really Jesus. It was G. It was. It was. It was. You know, game of telephone from sure. Jesus. Obviously, someone's going to fact check me on that. I'm really looking forward to reading this. The Rational Bible from Dennis Prager, of course. Prager, you please support them. Uh, Dennis Prager, thank you so much for being here, and we will have you back here in the next couple of weeks to do a full hour right. once I've read this. I haven't read it yet. I apologize. They just sent it to me. No, 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 no. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. We'll be back with uh, Gavin McInnes. Oh. It just isn't done that way. Now available at LottoWoodCrowderShop.com are genuine, authentic Ranger panties. The softest, lightest Ranger panties available with a built-in silk soft support liner. These Lottowood Crowder Ranger panties feel like teabagging an angel itself. Doing things like yard work. Or tending the garden. They keep me cool when training like doing pull-ups. Or dead hangs. 
These Ranger panties are so convenient, supportive, and comfortable, they can be used for almost anything. Like watching TV. <laughs> Doing the laundry. Laying in front of the fireplace, like Brad Reynolds, pee -pee. Or for covering up at those important meetings. For supporting America. Canada. Ranger Pain! Buy yours today at louderwithcrowdershop.com. Louder with Crowder Ranger Pants. Because the freedom of the Republic is at stake. Right between your thighs. One live read of the week time. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, click the notification bell because apparently subscribers don't, it doesn't mean anything on YouTube anymore. So you, you hit that, but you need to update that bell because you did it last time when we only had like 1.2 million subscribers. Lottowithcredit.com slash mug club. People who are watching or listening to this uh, on iTunes, uh, you're missing the daily show. We do this show Monday through Thursday and then Not Get Jared does Morning Grinders, of course, with our, our brothers there. At Which CRT. is now live streaming. Yeah, now they're live streaming. Live streaming. Uh, uh, on a, 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 uh, 10, 10 a.m. Friday mornings. 10 a.m. Eastern? Eastern? I thought it was 9 a.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Eastern. So that's another thing we need to have to talk Central. about. But lottowithcredit.com slash mug club. It's $99 annually, $69 for veteran students or active military. There's a 30-day trial going on. Mm -hmm. Keeps 15 people on this show alone employed, let alone Mark Levin and Gavin McGinnis, all these other people we've par partnered up because we want to make sure we still keep the content free for you on YouTube. I know some of you can't afford it, and listen, we still want you watching. Still going to upload clips every day, but you're missing the full show. So if you want this to continue... Uh, and, and you want people here to, to make a living, this is, this is the solution. This is as good as we can do right now without it being charity, and we're trying to earn your dollar. Lottowithcredit.com slash mug club. Try it for 30 days free, and if you don't like it, well, then you, you don't get a mug. You can't try it and get a mug and then not send it because we just, mm. no. Bunny ran away. <laughs> Things will get better. Orphanage ain't lit. Same mother. Orphanage ain't lit. I don't know what it is with the shoulder tick with that one. That's weird. And right while we were during the break, uh, our producer was, was well, not, not our producer, our next guest's producer mm -hmm. was yelling at him. They were yelling back and forth. Like, can, we get the, can we get the wide shot or the tight shot? I don't know if the wide's going to work. So it just set me in a great mood great for mood. a calm, collected, conversational interview. We'll do it live. Uh, of course, you know this guest. He's one of our favorite guests, one of our most regular guests, him and, him and that, uh, that, that Jew Shapiro. They're, mm. they're t number one and number two, depending on the week. His show is Get Off My Lawn. On the CRTV, you can follow him on the Twitter as long as he's still there. Uh, Gavin <laughs> underscore McInnes. Gavin, how are you, sir? I'm wonderful. Yeah, it's funny you mention that. Every time I check Twitter, it's sort of like, uh oh, here we. Oh, it still works. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's a pleasant surprise at this point. I have no expectations. <laughs> it's kind of like when I went to go see Ready Player One. I had zero ah. expectations. Only it it was an unpleasant surprise. It was worse than zero expectations. Um, yeah. Speaking of low expectations, you have before you, uh, I believe, the, 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 the time 100, times most 100 influential people. I bungled that, but I know you, you've been beside yourself over this. The bigotry of low, low expectations flourishes on this list. It really is amazing. They've got, they've got the categories are artists, entertainers, icons, and leaders. I don't know why artists and entertainers are different. I don't know why right. icons and leaders are different. And the criteria that they've chosen for this starts Wait, how with... How is Kamal Kunijani, the guy from Silicon Valley, how is he on the top 100 most influential list? Well, first, let, let me explain the priorities. It goes visible minority, good for <laughs> diversity, then woman, and then are they influential r at all? And that's number three. Well, well you know what? Followers. This would also say that there's a bias... Uh, for trannies who are what they call the barely passables in the community. Because if it's a, if it's a passable, they wouldn't be a visible minority. No. So it's got to be someone okay. who you're like, well, they're sprouting. That's the <laughs> only way they make a list. Well, what does influential mean? I think it means, say I was to say, everyone, you got to go vegan. Everyone, vegan, vegan, vegan. How many people would go vegan? I think actors assume they have a lot of influence because they have 17 million followers. But that's just because people like looking at you or they like when you're James Bond or something. It doesn't mean we're going to you for our education policy. So they're not influential. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good point. It's a, we've talked about this before. If you look at late night hosts uh, on, on the main networks and cable television, and if you look at their interactivity online for the size of the audience that you would think they have, it is unbelievably uh, remote. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it continues to surprise me. Like, for example, when you look at Comedy Central, Comedy Central, the show Jordan Klepper is a new show. We were just talking about it, how, how terrible it is. It's after The Daily Show. Yeah. I mean, it, our numbers well, would just when you start massacre. With the, you're starting with The Daily Show. Yes, you're, you're starting with The Daily Show. So yeah, yeah, so it could only, only get worse. Take Jon Stewart, have that, 
cut it, cut it in half, and then you have this guy, Jordan Klepper. He has 70,000 Twitter followers, and no, but more importantly, no one interacts with him, and with so much money. Do you think there's a disconnect where they just, they, they've been conditioned to think, well, we spent this much money on advertising, so we have this much influ influence, and it doesn't work anymore? Yeah, that, that's the huge mistake with this entire list. And Trevor Noah is on the list, by the way. Oh. Every, it seems like there's, there's like a third black woman, but they're all entertainers or underachieving writers who have put out a book or a poem or something. And then every time they cut to a white guy, which is very rare and begrudgingly, you have someone like Carl June who trained children's T cells to fight cancer. Yeah. So that, or, or you got this guy, John Wei Pan, who uh, used quantum communication to declare quantum states of, I don't understand, something with photons. Right. They're so. Really they're really trying he's to make clearly really like Bobby part Brown. of the 0 .01 top people in the world. And then he's with the main chick. The first one you get to is some chick who's, what's her name here? I, I think I got her here. She's in a movie with Kevin Hart. And uh, <laughs> no, Tiffany close. Haddish. That's it. Tiffany and Haddish. Kevin Hart wrote the write-up for her. Yeah, exactly. She's great. Well, you know, so it's it's kind of like maybe the person who split the atom wrote her forward. Maybe that's how you maybe that's how you make the list. I, though I will say, I saw Hugh Jackman on that list. Is that is that just because he's gay? <laughs> <laughs> what the, his, does everyone his not wife know is that? Unattractive. You, you, that, you know what? That's exactly what we talk about here. First off, when I saw him on the cover of People, I, I thought, well, the show tunes when he hosted the Oscars, and he wasn't he wasn't just doing show tunes. It was very Ethel Merman, you know. There's no business like show. But I'm like, that's Hugh Jackman. Wow, he's wearing a lot of <laughs> mascara. Then I see him on the cover of People magazine, full on like porcelain doll makeup, and then I'd heard the rumors that, of course, he was blatantly homosexual. And then I did see his wife, who, um, I mean, I hate to, but uh, uh, homely. In comparison to, you know, rated sexiest man in America. And I'm going like, ah, come on. I don't all get the these fit. beards, by the way, like Oprah's husband. Is sustenance so rare? What are we, in the Congo? No, he's not her like, husband. She never married him. Okay, whatever they are. Like, to, to live a lie like that, for what? <laughs> a a, a, a sub-zero fridge and free <laughs> spaghetti? Like, well, I don't understand why you want to be a whore to some homosexual and not have your own life. Well, I'm pretty sure Steve Desmond is, uh, he's, he's getting free Oprah's favorite things, goodie bags. So awesome. It's hard to fit a minivan in those bags, but somehow she does it. Um, okay, so, so who else do we have on this list? The Times 100 most influential. This is oh, actually. Oh, here's my favorite. Oh, so Prince Harry, thank God for Prince Harry. Hasn't he been amazing this year doing all that <laughs> stuff he does? I do feel bad for him, though, going bald in the public eye. Like, that's really tough to do. <laughs> Actually, no, wait, his brother was the one. Sorry, Prince Harry. But I like well, Prince Harry. Look, it's Donald Trump, pretty influential guy, right? Could yeah. start World War III. That's, that's an influence. <laughs> and then Prince Harry, I don't know, he went to a, a ribbon-cutting ceremony and ate some cookies. And then his girlfriend. Well, she's Prince Harry's girlfriend. That matters. She t touched some starving little Ethiopian kid, on, patted him on the head. We need her in the mix. <laughs> it, Sadiq Khan. Well... Like, you got Sadiq Khan and Justin Trudeau. They are influential in that Sadiq ruined London and Justin Trudeau is ruining Canada. That's, that's How do they influence. put together this list and not, you know, how do they not have a footnote, footnote? Like, Sadiq Khan, by the way, did become a national embarrassment by proposing knife control. And, you know, it was rebutted by people simply stating two words, kitchen knives, and now, you know, his career is over. How do they not even mention, do they not see the embarrassment from a lot of these people? I mean, no, I watched, they, well, look, the elephant in the room is always women, and I'm sure women ran this thing. And, uh... There I, is don't think, I don't think with time it's women. I think it's gay men in New York. I think it's it, it's gay LGBTQ AAIP men in New York who want to make themselves feel good. Your, your neck of the woods, it, Gavin. What's going on there? Yeah. What? what? You, what's in? It's in your neck of the woods over there. Time. What, what's in the water? You're right. The magazine industry in New York is predominantly gay, but it's also <laughs> heavily women, and they have the exact same taste. They both love Trevor Noah for no reason, but there are <laughs> negative write-ups in here. <laughs> I don't know any like, women who like Trevor Noah. I don't know oh, one. Oh, well, they have to be over 40. Okay. But, um, <laughs> they have Trump's EPA guy. He's on the list. And it's written by the previous EPA woman who was pushed out. And she hates his guts and thinks he's going to ruin the country. So she gets to do a write-up. I mean, these people are so blindly partisan that it's just weak, flimsy propaganda. Yeah. 
I, Millie Bobby Brown was in there. I noticed. It's, it's from Millie Trump. Bobby Brown. Stranger Things. She was the the, the least interesting part of is all she, of Stranger she Things. She's number 11? Yeah, 11. A yeah. little kid in Stranger Things. I thought Karen Stone hey. was on the list. I thought one of ours made the, made the, <laughs> made the cut. <laughs> no, oh, I no one we remotely like is on this list. Even They even got the guy who was underneath Mugabe while all the white farmers were being assassinated down there. And then... He's there because he said, you know what, let's give the farms back. Yeah, yeah you want to give the farms back now that everyone's starving to death. How influential of you. Honorable mention Coney on that list. <laughs> it is, well, you know, it's like you talk about flimsy propaganda. We, we actually had this in the show map, and we cut it because we were going, no one will believe us. No. Front page CNN today. Front page CNN.com. It said that there was an article that said, Donald Trump announces he, he will seek re-election. I scrolled through, what, four or five paragraphs? Yeah. And this is front page news, right? You would probably think, hey, wow, this is big news. We thought this is big. Maybe let's corroborate it. Anywhere else? Nowhere. They took a statement from before he'd ever become president that he said he might seek re-election if his first term goes well. And then commentary from Republicans who may or may not back him. This was front page news. They're not even trying anymore, which to me is hysterical. Okay, can we start to get bigoted here? No. This has got to be gays and women in the media. There's got to be something going on here. This must be the the uh, the dads, the patriarchs, abdicating the throne to this new generation of people who don't really care what's in the news. They just like the look of it. And this, it's got the newest flash, this list, on the website. You can't scroll around. It's a nightmare to go back and forth with, but it does look nice, and it is pretty black people and exotic looking women from all over the world nothing to do with substance no. each article is a paragraph long by the way yeah well that's that's how you know they're influential <laughs> like they were so influential we we could only fit it now that, 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 that being said uh with donald trump who should probably be number one whether you like it or not you don't need a paragraph i should just say president of the united states oh wait ted cruz wrote that Good for him making amends after he accused his dad of assassinating JFK. They really, they really did. <laughs> and called his wife ugly, don't forget. I know, I know. Um, all right, Gavin, we do have to go. I do uh, recommend people go out and check out this lesson. Of course, your show, which is Get Off My Lawn. How can people sign up for that uh, wonderful program? They go to CRTV.com, and I, if you sign up, you become a member of a thing I'm doing called the Mug Group. Yeah. Where yeah. it's a thing I invented, and you're part of this group. And you all get a mug like this. Yeah. And you can, you know, it's a fun concept where we all feel like we're part of a community, part of a group, and we all have the same mug. Exactly. It sounds like a lot of fun. Let's, let's see that mug, Gavin. Let's see that. Let's let's see that wonderful. Oh, it's got my face on it. Yeah, there there, you, go. Go. there you, go. you go. Spared no expense. And, uh, Went down to Staples with a screen print. But you know, this one here is, is hand etched, so I'm 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 pretty proud of it. So you know it's good. All oh, right. This is etched. Gavin, no, this is etched. Gavin McGinnis on etched. CRTV. And Get tune into my lunch. show, McGinnis with higher volume. I don't know. I, I wasn't even prepared for this. This is another show? No, it's, I'm changing the name. Okay, well, then we have to Much go. For Audible <laughs> with You're McKinnis. saying words that make no sense. We're going to wrap up the show after this. We'll be back. With the Stranger Pain! Buy yours today at louderwithcrowdershop.com. Louder with Crowder Ranger Pain. Because the freedom of the Republic is at stake, right between your thighs. dance thank you to dennis prager and to uh, gavin mcginnis you know what i just because i'm still i'm still sick i'm I really pinched, out of breath i pinched my nose yeah and because of this my nostrils stuck for about a, about 10 <laughs> seconds so i was breathing like this <laughs> thank god my mic wasn't on so uh which by the way for, again formal apology tuesday was the worst show i've ever done and and that's why i want to talk about this last segment as well 
I just felt bad about it because you deserve better, and I was I was sick, and we came. We had done the change my mind, and if yeah. you listen to it, you can hear people like it hurts my voice to hear. I was on death's door. I literally said I had no thoughts. I think at one point. Yeah, at like, one point. Like I have my my brain we, is not here. We you know uh, we don't really get to take days off with with this show in the same way that most people do. You, I don't really get to take a sick day, but uh, you know you, you know what that was right there. That was an excuse, and you shouldn't give it to me. It was a crappy show, <laughs> and it was my fault. And you deserve better. And you know, and I was actually thinking about this. I felt bad. My wife can tell you all night because this was given to me, not to get sentimental, but this is kind of what this last segment is. This was given to me by, by a guy at SMU. I'm sorry, man, if I forgot your name, if it's David, if it's Chris, b- basic white guy name. Um, it's his Navy Cross. Mm. Remember he came yeah, up remember, afterwards? I remember that. And he said, I, wa- I said, I, I can't take this. He said, no, no, I really, really want you to have this. And I said, I, I can't. You know, it was, it was like almost like, like an old Jewish couple. I can't. I can take the cross. Take, and I, I really felt genuinely bad taking it because I thought, well, you know, in two years from now, he's probably going to hate our show. That's the natural <laughs> arc. But he said, no, I re- listen, you really, really helped me get through a hard time. Uh, and uh, when I was serving, I re- appreciate it. And you gave us this here, a Navy Cross. And I, I'm kind of ashamed to say I didn't really know. Hmm. Uh, a ton about a Navy Cross, uh, but I guess it's the second highest sort of medal of honor that you can get for an act wow. of, of heroism. So when I see that and I go, oh, you know, and I have a sinus infection and I lost my voice, I don't know what this guy did to earn this cross, but I guarantee you it was worse than that. <laughs> I guarantee you it was worse than pulling a few 16-hour shifts in a row with four hours of sleep because he probably did that while he was being waterboarded and having someone saw off his hands with a machete. So <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, please send an email through the Lattice Carter website so I can catch your name. I I, I really would love to, to, to talk with you, and um, we're going to hang it somewhere. Where do you think we should put this? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know, but I, I, I've had it next, in a little cloth. Put it next to the liquor. That seems appropriate. Yeah, put it next to the, <laughs> to the liquor. I've had it next uh, uh, on a cloth, so I don't know. I want to put it some. You know, I'm going to put it on the floor because the car, I don't want to damage this. So, you know, it meant a lot to me, and, and, and you guys deserve the best show we can possibly deliver. And I know we have a fraction of, we have a fraction of the budget of Seth Meyers' salary, yeah. uh, and we do the best we can, but... Uh, no, there's, there's, there's no excuse for not showing, not, not, not being at the top of our game. And one thing, you know, I kind of want to talk about was we were, they were, we were all in a bad mood because we were sick. We've been overworked. I've had a lot of like, maybe at some point I'll talk about kind of some personal pressures, things going on the last couple of weeks. But um, something I will say, and I've been thinking about Dennis Prager, his happiness hour a lot, and he, ha- he, he has this philosophy: it's your moral obligation to be happy. And I actually had someone who was a, a doctor say, well, you know, no one else, is, you're not responsible for each other's happiness talking about spouses. And I, I just, I completely disagree. I believe you are largely responsible for your spouse's happiness through being happy yourself. I mean, no one's going to be happy yeah. if you're a miserable husband all the time, if you're a miserable wife all the time. It doesn't mean that someone else who's a miserable bastard, you know, you take it on yourself. But it is your job to try and set a tone in a house. And it is your job to try and set a tone with the people you meet. It is, your, it is our job, even after we've done, you know, a two-hour show. Whether it's SMU, whether it's Illinois, whether it's uh, you know A&M or what we're going to be doing in the fall, a whole tour, and you've been setting up for nine hours, yep. it is your job to set a tone even when you're doing the after party, the meet and greet, and you have no voice to make sure that you're happy to be there. Because you know, I thought about it. How would you feel, and most of you feel this way, but a lot of your burdens that you think about, for example, that day I did not want to do a show. Tuesday, I was like, I just, you know, I was basically hunkered down like Bubble Boy until the show threw off the covers and came in. I was just so, so sick. But then I thought, you know what? What if I didn't have it? How would I feel five years down the line if I squandered this and I just, I just didn't appreciate it? And that's where you can really, I mean, that's the tale of, of, of Ebenezer Scrooge, really. Yeah. That's the tale of people, the, the lost redemption that they never got. So think of it that way. Whatever burden it is in your life that you don't want to do, it's probably something pretty consequential. And I want you to think for a little, just for a short moment, how would you feel if you didn't have it? Often it's a relationship. Well, how would you feel if you didn't have that relationship? Sometimes it's a job. Would you rather not have that job? Sometimes it's a friend. A lot of the times there's that old, that old uh, I don't know what you call it, that old, I don't know if it's a folk tale or whatever it is. It's kind of a, a fable where people all put their problems into a hat. They mix it up and they could pick any problem out of that hat and everyone picked their own problem back. Yeah. My dad told me that when I was a kid. And you had a point. You were mentioning that. Yeah. Uh, this, I mean, call it, you know, I, I, I feel like God's been teaching me this and you can be triggered if you want, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, will be. Yeah, Have no. Sam Harris on. I know. invited him on. So kind of, kind of lesson I've been learning lately that kind of ties into that is, is this idea that uh, being okay with, with troubles in life. And, and we, we know from, from John 16 that, you know, just. You will have troubles. It's yeah. promised. It's a guarantee. And I think we, we go through this life sometimes with this idea that if you just work hard enough to get to a place where we're going to be caught up with something, we're going to get, we're get caught up in everything and everything's going to be smooth and every relationship is going to be just harmonious in every, every facet. Yeah. I think like, think about it kind of like owning a car. 
I think we think about it when we have a flat tire. Like, that's a big failure of owner car ownership. It's like, that's not a failure of car ownership. That's just part of owning a car. It's something you deal with. It's the more frequent part of owning a car, considering the city club parking lots. This is true. Which you spend This time. is true. But I think about it in marriage or anything else. You know, you, when, when you have hard times, it's not a failure of marriage to have a hard time. No. It's, it's, it's when people say marriage is hard, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. So I think it was embracing the rough patches and being okay with that friction in life is, I think, is something that's important to do. It's a good point. And I think Winston Churchill said uh, success is moving from one fa- is the ability to move from one failure to another. And mm-hmm. we talk about that a lot. And listen, you talk you talk about you know Jesus. That's one thing I remember. I had a pastor or someone saying, you know, the opposite of love is fear. Is that fear is the only one second? You don't think Jesus was afraid when he was literally praying? If, again, just take yeah. it as a parable. If you're going to be triggered, take it as just a, a, a fable. But him saying, "Take this cup from me," right before he knew he was about to be crucified, kind of a rough way to go. As far as I'm concerned, there's uh, uh, sticking the glass catheter down your pee hole and smashing it like they do in, in one of those Asian countries. I don't know which one. Jamming wood chips up your thumbs. Crucifixion. It's right up there. Pretty rough. And he said, if there's any other way, please show me. And I won't do this. And guess what? There was no other way. Mm. That's the story of Christ. There is no other way. And so then he made a decision and said, okay, the op- I'm going to do this. The opposite of love is really more of apathy. Apathy would, be, I feel like, be a better... I just, think I, I just think it's hate. Maybe hate. I don't know. I, I mean, it's just, but it's, it's something that people throw around because they want to sound smart. Oh, I took, yeah. I, I took Humanities 101, too. The opposite of love is fear. Shut up. I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid of sharks. I don't hate sharks. I watch Shark Week. I just don't want to be eaten by one. But no, that's, that's a good point that you talk about with marriage. It's not a failure. The failure is to, is to stop. And I think uh, uh, this is one thing I've just kind of been, you know, prayer is one thing and then meditation is another. And I talked about how I couldn't do these guided meditations because they were so freaking lazy. My doctor said, do this guided meditation where it, it kind of helps where someone is telling you to relax. They go, relax your jaw, relax your, you know, and, and I've done that before actually as an, as an athlete, guided stretching. Where they're yeah. like, okay, flex your hamstrings, release it. So I know there's something to it. But what really bothered me about the guided meditation is I, this, the worst part was this one woman said, you are walking up to a staircase. It, it's a peaceful staircase. It could be made of wood or some other material. I'm like, well, what is it made of? That could be anything at that point. <laughs> These aren't exactly the dimensions for the synagogue in the Old Testament. Like, come on, you're giving me no specificity. <laughs> but meditation is important. Meditation is not from prayer. It's about clearing your head or focusing on one thing. And Dennis Prager talks about your moral obligation to be happy. And something that's helped me absolutely, and I think for everyone, if you just take this attitude, listen, first off, choose to be grateful. Now, not just choose gratitude. Choose to be grateful. Gratitude is an emotion. A lot of times people separate and say, well, that's an involuntary emotion. I can't control it. Yeah, you can. You absolutely can control it, just like this guy who was grateful enough for our show to give me his Navy Cross. Now, to me, that's silly. I should should be earning something to the equivalent and giving it to him, but I will cherish it out of respect for him. Thank you, sir. But that is him choosing to be grateful. Him saying, the crap hit the fan, and I was grateful to have your show. You can choose gratitude at any point in your life. Choose to be grateful for things that you have. Then number two, these are, these are the three things that have been a huge turnaround for me. And I used to do it and I got away from it because some things were bothering me. So listen, just like with the change my mind stuff, it doesn't work if you don't follow the book. And I don't follow my own book sometimes. Choose to be grateful. Then number two, choose to be happy. And I don't just mean be positive. Again, because that's something that people say, well, I can't be positive. No, no. Choose to be happy. That means in the face of negativity, you choose to be happy regardless. Grateful. Yeah. Choose to be happy. And then number three, choose to be excellent. I don't mean that in the Bill and Ted sense. Choose to be grateful, choose to be happy, and choose to be excellent. Because you know what? That will actually lead to more of one and two. I've talked about this so many times. So many people here have never redlined it their whole life. Whether it's lifting the heaviest thing you can, running as fast as you can and measuring it, getting your heart beating as fast as you can, taking the most difficult intellectual test, driving a car as fast as you can, finding something that you're good at and redlining it as hard as you can. Everyone needs to do that at some point in their life. I think everyone needs to do it actually frequently in their life because you don't know the measure of a man until you do that. But find what, find the thing in which you are excellent and choose to be excellent. If it's guitar, if it's basketball, if it's science, choose to be excellent. Guess what? You're going to have a lot to be grateful for because if you know if you're li- you know that you're living in your purpose and you're using your gifts, and I don't mean in some abstract yogi kind of way. I mean, find practically what you are good at doing and be excellent at it. And while you are doing it, and when you when you run into those hurdles, like we were talking about, Naka here just made a brilliant point about that. Don't see it as a failure. That is an opportunity for you to be grateful for the fact that you are even attempting and live in a country where you have the ability to attempt to be excellent and be happy. Choose to be happy that you are pursuing excellence in something. But if you remove that third one, 
That's where you have a lot of people out there who are purposeless. And that's where people seep in with ideas like toxic masculinity because competitiveness, competitiveness, drive, aggression. These are not bad things. These are good things when harnessed. So if you are going forward this week and you feel like you've been in a funk, meditate on this. I will tell you, it is. It, it, I haven't read it in a book. No one told me, but they said, hey, you know, maybe write down some gratitudes and write it down in your office. This is something that a doctor told me. And I said, okay, it didn't really help. Write down a Bible verse. But meditating on choose to be grateful. List what you're grateful for. Count your blessing. Choose to be happy. And before you walk out that room in that session, choose to be excellent in the opportunities you've been given. Try that. Let me know how it works out. Could change your life. It's helped mine. Sometimes. Sometimes I'm still a dick. See you next week.